Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Anuj Chavla. I'm an orthopedic and a foot and ankle surgeon. Today, I'm going to talk about flat foot assessment and management. So what is flat foot? Flat foot, we also call it as a pest planus deformity. So it is very obvious and in the layman terms, we already know that this is collapse of medial longitudinal arch. But is it just the collapse of medial longitudinal arch which constitutes flat foot or is it something more? Well, definitely yes. It is much more than just a collapse and it is actually a three-dimensional deformity. It doesn't just involve the arch, it involves the hind foot as well as the forefoot and the midfoot also. So, what are the deformities that actually happen in a flat foot or a pest planus or a pest plano valgus foot? So, first is a heel valgus and some people call it a pronation deformity as well. How do you know or how do you examine for heel valgus? Well, if a patient is standing and you are standing behind the patient and you're looking at the back of the foot and the ankle. So you draw an imaginary line along the axis of the Achilles tendon and draw a line along the axis of the heel or calcaneum. Normally these two lines are either parallel or there is a less than 10 degree of valgus angulation in this. So if you look at this angle, if it is more than 5 degrees, 5 to 10 degrees, that means there is a significant hind foot valgus. The other deformity is a forefoot abduction deformity. Actually, the abduction happens at the midfoot region, which is the talonavicular or calcaneocuboid joint. So when we talk about the forefoot abduction, we can just see that the patient's foot normally would be pointing like this, bit straight, but in case of a flat foot, it goes laterally. So the whole forefoot ab gets abducted around the talonavicular joint. Similarly, when you look at the patient from the back, you would see that more than two toes are visible. This is also called as too many toes sign and it also signifies forefoot abduction. Another deformity that happens at the forefoot is the supination or sometimes called forefoot varus. So this deformity happens to compensate for the heel valgus that the patient has at the hind foot. So to maintain the tripod, the, always the patient touches his heel, first metatarsal head and the fifth metatarsal head. But because of the hind foot valgus, there is a compensatory forefoot varus or forefoot supination to maintain the tripod of the foot. So this supination initially is compensatory, but as the time progresses, it can become fixed and might need to be addressed surgically as well. So when we talk about flat foot in a ch child, normally the foot or the arch may be flat in a lot of individuals. And as they grow, the arch may develop and they start appearing at the age of five to six years. So whether it is actually a development of arch or whether it is just a contouring of the heel fat pad, I think probably we do not really know the exact answer of it. But yes, we do know that all the children who would have flat foot in the childhood will not have it after the first decade of life. So let us talk about the medial longitudinal arch and its support. So what is the medial longitudinal arch? So the bony support of the medial longitudinal arch is the medial half of the calcaneum, the talus, navicular, medial and the middle cuneiform and the first two rays. So what are the supports, muscular supports of the medial longitudinal arch? So the most important muscular support of medial arch is the tibialis posterior. The tibialis posterior, as you can see, it comes and attaches onto the navicular tuberosity. And this is one of the significant dynamic stabilizers 
of the medial longitudinal arch an attenuation or a tear of tibialis posterior or an insufficiency of tibialis posterior may predispose a patient to have a flat foot deformity in the future apart from that the other muscles like flexor hallucis longus and intrinsic plantar muscles they also help in maintaining the medial longitudinal arch what are the passive support of or passive stabilizers of the longitudinal arch these are the ligaments so which ligament are the most important i think the most important and the significant ligament is the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament or what we also call as spring ligament so spring ligament is another important and a static stabilizer of the longitudinal arch and it has a significant role to play in development of flat foot deformity it is even said that maybe the spring ligament may be the first structure to attenuate even before the tibialis posterior and so it needs to be assessed clinically as well as radiologically apart from that the plantar aponeurosis and the plantar ligaments also help in maintaining the medial longitudinal arch so my talk would start with the pediatric flat foot in which i would talk about both the flexible as well as rigid flat foot and then it would be followed by the adult acquired flat foot so what is a flexible flat foot a flexible flat foot is the one that we see in a child in which when the child stands he would have a flat foot deformity but as soon as the patient stops weight bearing and lift his foot up the uh, flat foot or the collapse of medial longitudinal arch would disappear well most of the times we have seen that there might be some inheritance of flexible flat foot deformity so someone in the family either mother father or some close relative or maybe even a distant relative may have a flat foot ligaments and capsular laxity has been actually uh, one of the causes due to which the flexible flat foot develop and as with age the ligaments joint capsule as well as the muscles tighten the arch improves wearing shoes in the childhood well there is no clear cut evidence of it but there are some studies which quote that those who wear a lot of shoes they do not develop a, uh, an appropriate proprioception of the heel and the foot also the intrinsic muscles of foot do not develop a lot in them but whether it is a definite cause well probably or probably not so there's a question mark in that always rule out rigid flat foot before saying that yes the patient has a flexible flat foot deformity so when we talk about rigid flat foot we are talking about tarsal coalition what is tarsal coalition it is failure of segmentation of the two tarsal bones during the birth so it can be a bony coalition it can be cartilaginous coalition or it can be fibrous it depends upon the type of union between the two tarsal bones what happens in a tarsal coalition normally there is a limitation of movement which leads to inflammation and that can be the triggering event or that might cause the pain it is also termed as peroneal spastic flat foot because of the inflammation that happens in the lateral aspect of the foot and the peroneal tendons so the two most common coalitions are the talocalcaneal coalition and calcaneonavicular coalition so when we talk about the talocalcaneal coalition it normally happens in the middle facet of the talocalcaneal joint it comprises of approximately 48 or maybe around half of the total uh, population of coalition 8 to 12 years of age this is when they start showing symptoms why they start showing symptoms at such a 
such a late stage well there have been a few theories about it it can be uh, when the fibrous uh, coalition is becoming bony that leads to further limitation of movement or some micro fracture happening or maybe uh, sometimes the limitation of movement stimulating the inflammation calcaneo navicular coalition total of approximately 43% so that means these two coalition actually make more than 90% of the cases and it is the patients who have calcaneo navicular coalition manifest with pain which comes at are even later at the age of 12 to 16 years or in their adolescence